When I moved here 12 years ago, there wasn't much here. There were these storefronts, but they, this was not here. It was empty, this was empty. It was uh, no man's land. So we bought our house on Cedarville, South of the Danny, in 1994. We didn't do anything socializing in our neighborhood at all. There was a lot of uh, crime and, and safety issues back in the day. It was nowhere that you would want to go. I mean, I like grit. I love that about the Danny. It still has some grit. I want to keep that. Um, but it definitely needed revitalization. And there was no kind of community uh, spirit. Everyone kind of did their own thing. I live down there and a kid who went to daycare at Coxwell. So this was my stopping ground daily, back and forth. And I would look in the windows with the dirty, grimy, empty displays, and I would wonder why it was and what I could do. We started doing storefront um, facelifts, and we did about five or six. I started writing a little bit about it, and a reader sent me something on Marcus Westbury um, in Australia. So I read about that project and I interviewed him on the phone. Renew Newcastle started because there was about 150 empty buildings in the, in the two main streets of my hometown. And the theory we had was if you could take them and fill them with people who had projects they wanted to start, it would be a win-win. It would reduce the vacancies and it would um, hopefully help those people go on to bigger and better things. I think people were thirsty for change. A lot of people felt like we did. There was a lot of vacant storefronts. But about four years ago, we, a group of us, realized that if we really wanted to affect change in the neighborhood, deal with all the empty storefronts. And it was a tough time, I think, for them to get one key landlord. And then the testament to the success was that that key landlord ended up <laughs> running the pop-up shop crusade. I can't say enough good things about my experience with the pop-up shop project as a property owner. I was so impressed by the actual process of cleaning up the store and helping me find a tenant that I decided to volunteer for the project. It made me want to give back to the community and help, help do this for other property owners with empty stores. So since the project started, we've had over 200 entrepreneurs apply to be part of the pop-up shop project. We've had 32 pop-up shops open in the neighborhood. Six of those shops have turned into um, permanent shops in the neighborhood, which is always really exciting. And we've worked with 15 different properties over the course of the project, and it's exciting to say that all 15 of those properties are now filled with permanent tenants. Running your own shop really seems like something akin to winning the lottery. It's, it's not gonna happen, but well, you keep playing your numbers and maybe it'll come up. I would look into spaces, see how much they were for rent, but there's a lot of technical jargon that goes into the, uh, the ads for these spaces. I mean, what is TMI anyway? You might have the great ideas and all of the best products or the best services, but if you don't know how to actually make any of that a reality, the DECA pop-up shop program is really there to turn your vision into reality. I like local business. I shop local. <laughs> the appeal of the pop-up program for us was it kind of eliminated some of the risk. If we were going to do this on a full-time basis, uh, most landlords wanted a, like a two-year lease commitment. So that's right then, that's a huge outlay of cash. And the pop-up provided an incubator stage so you could sort of work through all the logistics of that without having to, you know, spend you know, $20,000 a year to pay for rent. And it was very good that way to revitalize neighborhoods and to have, have the opportunity to come in and try something and test something, and then you can tweak it as you go, is brilliant. You guys have been ahead of the pack of many communities in Toronto because you have been proactive. And you've taken the lead, you've come together, you realize that you know the Strip has future potential, but you don't want it to just have the gentrification take over and let the market 
produce the end result. So you've used the principle of what's called urban acupuncture, which is you, you focus on key spots and opportunities and then exercise, you know, a lot of uh, energy onto those spots. And I think that's the approach that you guys have followed. And I haven't been out here for a while, but over the last, uh, well, a year, year and a half, two years, I can feel a difference here. I can see a difference. There's more energy on the street, obviously more businesses, and things are uh, coming together. I really think the secret ingredient is community involvement. The fact that we had that many people involved locally in the grassroots level is actually a very important ingredient because you then build on the sense of community and these are the people that will shop in those stores. One of the things that I've always said to my students is cities change all the time. Sometimes for better, sometimes for worse. So you obviously want to guide that in a positive direction. And I, I think that is the kind of relationships that you guys have built up here and what you're continuing to do.